Hello, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Ellen Mueller. I'm the director of the MFA program at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And I wanted to start tonight before we introduce our speakers by respectfully acknowledging that the land that we are occupying in Minneapolis is unceded territory, the ancestral homelands of the Dakota people. Gathering here, we pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. We acknowledge the grave harm that colonialism has brought to these lands, in particular, the erasure of both indigenous and African identities, not only under slavery, but by racist laws that have segregated all people. We honor those who have lived and do live now at, these inter at the intersection of identity and experience. All right, and I'm gonna move through just a few slides here to help us um, just do the nuts and bolts of this webinar. Um, your audio and video will be muted for this webinar. Feel free to leave any questions or comments in the questions area um, in your control panel. And we'll select from those submissions for the Q&A after all of the panelists have presented. Um, a recording of this webinar will be made available after the event. And you can find the full agenda of the conference at the link pictured here. Um, you can download PDF handouts in that menu area, and that links to some really great crowdsourced resources, such as a reading list and a, a group of assignments that you're welcome to contribute to yourself, um, as well as materials related to some of the presentations this evening. If any of you experience any technical difficulties, feel free to reach out at the email address pictured here, av underscore support at mcad.edu. And this event is sponsored by the MCAD MFA program. If you'd like to learn more about the MFA program, check out our link, mcad-mfa.com. Also, in our original iteration, when we were gonna have this event in person in Minneapolis, uh, I was really excited about um, this tour that we were proposing for the day after the conference. And so I wanted to give these folks a shout out because they're doing fantastic work. Um, and I just got news yesterday that they sold out their tours for the rest of the semester, or not the semester, but the summer. And um, you can sign up for their wait list. So I would encourage you to Google Learning from Place Fidote if you're in the Twin Cities region within driving distance. Check these out. They're really high quality. Um, and if you don't make it this summer, you can still attend these. They're gonna do it again next summer. So keep an eye on that. It's really great place-based learning. And also before we go on with the conference, I wanna really give kudos, thanks to our amazing technical support, our amazing administrative support, um, Kylie Van Note, Seth Dalseed, Cleo Young, Lauren Zimich, and Nikki Motocolum have all been so, so helpful in making sure that we could bring this event um, into fruition. And with that, um, I want to just say thank you for sticking with us through our various iterations of this conference as we continued towards tonight. Um, the idea for this conference came from recognition that many programs in higher education are moving towards increasing in community engagement and experiential learning, especially with place-based themes. And as time has moved past this spring, we've seen place highlighted uh, as we live through an ongoing pandemic, as we grapple with the civil unrest following the murder of George Floyd and too many others at the hands of the police. And now with the cruel uh, international regulations handed down by ICE, which were then rescinded just yesterday um, in countless ways. We are seeing how place intersects with our daily lives. So this feels very precinct. Um, and today I'm excited that we're gonna be examining the topic of place from many different viewpoints, from artists, from educators, from curators. And I hope that everybody attending tonight will find something useful to take away from these really great presentations. Um, so I'd like to start off tonight with a little poll, a little bit of interactivity. Um, so Seth, if you could put up our first poll, this is gonna ask um, what area of art or education do you work in or in. So go ahead and um, vote in there. Mark what best fits you. And it looks like we've got around 60% of people have responded. We're creeping up there. We've almost got everybody. 80%. Did 
just a little while longer, a couple more seconds. We're at 90% voted. Anyone else want to pitch in there? Okay, I think we'll call it. And let's see those results. All right, so we're seeing 7% K through 12. That's great. 91% higher ed, so big presence from higher ed tonight. 21% from community-based or nonprofit, and 5% are joining us from other places. So welcome, welcome to everyone. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce Jen Caruso, she, her pronouns, who will be presenting an engaged and public art minor, what it means to develop a program connected to a particular place. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jen Caruso. I think we're having a little technical difficulty with the audio. So um, just to fill this time while Jen's working on that with Seth, um, for folks who are in the audience, I would encourage people, um, feel free to take some notes and jot down your questions. Um, and uh, at the end, after we've heard from all six presenters, I'll be picking from the questions box. And thanks for those of you who are using that to let us know about the sound challenge. Um, I'm sure we're getting there um, close with fixing. I think the audio is working now. Wonderful, thank you, Jen. Thanks so much, and I'm gonna start again. Um, so just again, thank you to Ellen, um, and thank you all of those who are making time and space for conversation and reflection tonight. This presentation will offer a set of questions and reflections on developing a minor program in engaged in public art that is responsive to the ethos of place, attentive to the social forms and practices, culture and ecology of the Twin Cities and the Midwest bioregion. I'm going to modify this intent slightly and in that what I will actually do is share some reflections of what I learned from teaching three iterations of the course Art in the Cities, one of the three required courses for the Engaged in Public Art minor, which officially launched in fall 2017. Next scheduled to be taught in fall of 2021, these beginning reflections are in part a grounding, collecting, or centering exercise that will allow me to reflect upon the objectives, practices, and organization of the course as a way to think about the minor. These are reflections about what it has meant for me to teach a course about the cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, and about a bioregion, the Midwest, that I am not native to, that I have come to know through the preparations for and experience of place along with my students. Housed in liberal arts, Art in the Cities is one of the three required courses for the Engaged in Public Art minor. Tasked with exploring the relationship between art and urban space, it uses the Twin Cities as the primary site of investigation. Intended as a seminar style course focused on current exhibitions and curatorial practices in museums, galleries, artist run spaces, and other project spaces located throughout the Twin Cities, the course examines the history and contemporary practice and politics of display in multiple urban contexts, with some emphasis on social, public, interventionist, and community based practices. The organizing frame for the course evolved over three years and over time, but often took its cues from the Chicago Social Practice History series, edited by Mary Jane Jacob and Kate Zeller. The series began as an exhibition and research program from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago between 2012 and 2015 that sought a deep contextual understanding of social practice as place-based work. Emerging from an educational context, the series responded to a growing institutional interest in social practice and a concern about social practice gentrifying community arts and provided an alternative discursive framework showing that social practice could be seen as a rooted, sustained, and necessary way in which art, could be, in, in which art and society connected over time. The series presented the argument that social practice has deep roots in Chicago specifically and the Midwest generally. The first four books in the series, Institutions and Imaginaries, let me just go back one. Institution, the first of four books in the series, Institutions and Imaginaries, made the argument that it is the built environment, a city's institutions, that put forward the concept of a place, while the dreams of that place fuel their reason for coming into being. 
Support networks posited that Chicago's relative distance from the professionalized art world of the coasts allowed for the possibility of a community that can come from a supportive network, defining community built not through professionalized communication networks, networking, and on exchanges of information, but a shared and an ongoing articulation of what a meaningful life can be through the building of artist-run culture and spaces. A lived practice and immersive life practices, its concurrent exhibition, focused on 10 artists with long-term practices addressing critical social issues embedded in Chicago's histories. The same year as our program launched, 2017, an article in Vice's series, 50 States of Art by art critic and U of M faculty member, Christina Schmidt, building on their 2000, 2014 curatorial project, Thinking, Making, Living, made the observation that social practice thrives in the Twin Cities, citing the support of key, organization, key organizations and institutions, the ways in which artists are embedded in the cultural life of the cities, and the way in which artists are threaded into the social fabric in that they live and work in their neighborhoods. The conclusion of Ashley Duffalo's exhibition review on MN artists noted two works by Nate Young and John Kim included in the exhibition that felt out of place and that they don't fit the definition of socially engaged art, not obviously participatory, but that both effectively commented on the failures of participatory democracy and the rise of surveillance culture. Duffalo concluded that a society which ignores the voices and needs of the 99% is ripe for disaster. Rebecca Zorak's collection, Art Against the Law, the fifth book in the Chicago Social Practice History series, begins with the caveat that because it is framed as a topic, it may seem to be an anomaly or a deviation. Mary Jane Jacobs speculates as to whether this is a problem of the city or the particular city of Chicago, but notes that this topic permeates all social practice. In fact, in the 21st century, to work against the law has come to define the social role of the artist. Thus, MCAD's Engaged in Public Art Minor program launched in 2017 with the benefit of the curatorial attention of Christina Schmidt and the reflection of scholars like Rebecca Zorak, who when she moved to Chicago turned her critical attentional focus from Renaissance art to the city, and who sharply noted that social practice as practiced in the 21st century must be critique. It is the product of broad changes in political life, social relations, and the organization of space that have systematically destroyed the ideal of the public. As a result, all art practices merge into activism because they come face to face with authority faster and more physically than ever before. And writing in 2014, now twinned in public space are policing and fearfulness. For some, it is the police who are to be feared. For others, it is invisible threats, immigrants, terrorists, gang members, viruses from which the police are supposed to protect us. Perhaps in the term social practice, we can understand practice not as an art practice, but in the sense of preparation and training, training our imaginations for the better society we want to bring into being. MCAD's program also launched within, the particular political con within a particular political context, what Lisa Young Lee and Romy Crawford describe in their updated curatorial statement for Open Engagement 2017, Justice in the Aftermath of 2016's election, and the mass cultural response, the mass mobilization and organizing response, and the belief in cultural production as a strategy for transformation and resistance. It was at Open Engagement in Chicago, an itinerant artist-led and, and organized artist-led and organized convening, a site of care for the field of socially engaged practice, that I was introduced to a pedagogical framework that I began to adapt for art in the cities. Using a practice the radical educators Anthony Fryson and Colin Ward describe in the Exploding School, open engagement was an exploded conference that drew its content from its context, where conference goers experienced the sites and context of the city as part of the conference and educational experience. Perhaps it says something about me that I didn't quite hear that the site and context of the city should form part of an educational experience, as the first iterations of Art in the Cities had between eight to 10 field experiences over, fifth, over the 15 weeks. And while in practice, it seems like it could work if the course could alternate at least between campus dates, a day of reflection and preparation followed by a field trip, the course still had a hectic quality and didn't work like that in practice. 
In fact, I then began to overcompensate with vast reading lists, field trip guides, field trip assignments, question prompts to control our on-site discussions and planning meetings. Further, as I began to introduce myself through this course in this new program, I had to consider in what ways I was positioned in the city primarily as an educator. In 2019, Jen de los Reyes, the founder and director of Open Engagement and primarily an educator, uh, shared with us a way to think of a convening organization or institution that could function as a site of care and support a community of practice. And so I began to ask, what place could an educational program in engaged in public art, yes, even a minor program, come to serve as a support for practice in the city at this time within this context? But I had to learn to take my cues from the practitioners who had been doing this work. How do we even learn how to enter into the city? Fall 2018 began with a workshop with Marcus Young's Don't You Feel It Too. Dancing from MCAD's campus to Nicollet Avenue with my students um, helped help them feel in an embodied way what it is to enter increasingly surveilled public space. Young told the origin story to the students that the practice had developed in 2008 as a protest response during the militarization of St. Paul during the Republican National Convention, when protest actions were circumscribed to a designated protest area, described in detail by the project's chronicler, Gabrielle Civil, in Public Mysteries. Young shared with us the necessity of this now ongoing practice of breaking the law so that practitioners can come to feel what it is to enter and leave privatized space of their own agency and on their own terms, dancing, in Sybil's words, moving differently, modeling another way of being in the world. There are others for whom the city has been an ongoing site of investigation. Andy Sturtevant's 10-year practice of common room walks and his guidance to and his guidance through Whittier and the Skyways introduced us to the idea that most of which appears functionally public is actually private space, something that the Carry On Homes Collective discovered through their activation in the Creative City Challenge of downtown's so-called commons. What we came to learn was how much what we came to learn was how much the artists we connected with insisted on, demanded public space, the right to the city, to make a claim to home at the very moment that the civil rights were being called into question. We learned about gentrification and art washing, how it threatens the creative vitality of the city, or what Sarah Schumann calls the gentrification of creation. We learned this in numerous conversations, most pointedly with Ellen Hinchcliffe about the Lake Street Stories project, Remembering the Babylon, who introduced us to the story of the loss of one of the city's few queer performance spaces, and whose significance persists in the memories of those who found their work nurtured there. The artist-led initiatives that are holding space in the cities are increasingly threatened by gentrification and its attendant forces of surveillance, but with the knowledge that in making new space, there needs to be attention to the way the older spaces replicated the patterns of dominant culture. We have watched spaces close, iterate, change focus, water bars become raft. Um, um, having built a community through the itinerant Spearwave platform, Samal House of Art, Art now has a home. There is a story about the city and water, the city and global warming. There was a workshop with Shanae Matson at Water Bar. City artist Aaron Dysart, who met us one dark night when I misjudged the timing of sunset in the, uh, in the chill of Aunt Amanda Lovely's urban flower field, describes his, work, described his work as a city artist embedded in the water systems of the city of St. Paul. We waited another dark and stormy night under an overpass near the lock and dam until we heard for sure that Illuminate the Lock was indeed canceled as the artist ran out to tell us. And then we drove back to school, soaked amid flash flood, so soaking wet amid flash flood warnings. A site visit to the Center for Creative Collaboration at the Wiseman Art Museum with Boris Oikerman, Sarah Peters, and Daniel McCarthy Clifford for a discussion of artists and institutions brought together these artists who are working on with around the city state's institutions and linking together the carceral with the museum with the project and with and with the carceral with the museum and with the project of the university in particular i'm thinking of daniel mccarthy clifford's the section of disapproved books how can an educational curriculum attend to these broad change the to the broad changes in political life social relations the organization of space Educational sites are those for which, which make space for reflection on practice. How do I reflect on my own practice? One example. Because the city is the site of investigation, one of the key projects for the classes to develop in small groups, field guides to social practice in the cities, 
the field guides into food, timelines, maps, and legends, glossaries of critical terms, project descriptions, and individually written essays and a group written concluding synthetic essay. But what ways of knowing does the assignment of a field guide, the making of a map and a timeline, create when students form relationships with people in the cities through this class? In future iterations of the course, I will need to put into question the epistemic bias of the field guide, the, map, the, the field guide cartography and the map, and the assumptions it makes about knowledge as it relates to place and its connections to legacies of surveillance as it connects to the university as a project and as a site of knowledge production. So this year I am thinking about field experiences and what made them into real conversations, a reciprocal social form. These were ones in which I paid more attention to and we developed together the questions and concerns that the practitioners and curators were having about the city, their practice, social issues like gentrification, the role of the embedded civic artist, and where they welcomed together the, both the time to talk together and the reference points and questions that I and our students might bring. And while I thought that what I was doing was modeling conversations for students, in fact, I found that I was starting to practice with real intention what it means to connect myself to this place. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That was fantastic. There's so much there. So I look forward to Q&A. Um, next, we have Dr. Susan L. Smith, she, her pronouns, who will be presenting Witness, Site-Based Work and Social Practice at the Borderlands. And I believe we're going to have a video shown here shortly. And while we're waiting, I, I can just remind folks again, um, if any keywords or phrases, ideas stood out from Jen's, um, oh, here it comes. I want to thank Ellen and the Minneapolis College of Art and Design for inviting me to be a part of this amazing event. And also for this institution and all of us for being responsive to the current situation and the way we must adapt and recognize where it is we find ourselves socially and politically. The issue I've raised for myself here is site-specific teaching, and this for me is of vital importance. This issue encompasses questions of land politics, politics of place, of race, and the confinement of bodily movement, questions of death and giving, and the crossing of borders. But above these, the certainty that art has a vital place in confronting issues such as the humanitarian crisis at our southern border. In 2016, then Governor of Maine, Paula Page, and presidential candidate Donald Trump made their case that immigrants were not welcome in our country. The site-based social practice class I was working with that semester conceived of a performance and installation piece that confronted this discriminatory practice. The project, titled hashtag know there, not here, involved research into political policy and performance at the state capitol and it culminated in a video documentary exhibition and community workshops using shoes as a metaphor for the refugees students asked a local shoe store chain to donate some of their used shoes that they'd been collecting for our project the owner of the store, we found out, was himself a refugee whose brother had died as his family had fled Poland. We were amazed when an 18-wheeler pulled up to the building with 500 pairs of shoes. Students who had direct ties to Maine's fishing industry supplied a net and where hundreds of shoes then would be dragged in a net along the streets leading to the Capitol House in Augusta. To emphasize the lack of a safety net, not just for immigrants, but also then for Maine citizens, because injustice for some affects us all. As we dragged the net across Augusta and up to the steps of the Capitol building, passersby actually joined in to help. 
We then left those shoes as mute witnesses to the displaced people who were given no place to land in their flight from oppression, no acceptance here. At the same time, our eyes were open to the migration crisis of refugees crossing the Mediterranean, which at that point was at its height, culminating in a dead child lying on the sands of Turkish beach. Two students from Turkey in the class worked with a filmmaker who was traveling with refugees across Europe and collected audio narratives from those refugees. These stories were used with underwater imagery and collected audio to create a 360 immersive installation. The audio of the water and the asylum seekers speaking in their native languages worked to submerge the viewer and the ever empty shoes. It was imperative that the students understand this as a global crisis that has both implications and connections far beyond their state of Maine, that we work locally but stay aware of the larger global picture. The video documentation of the performance was requested by the state legislatures for use as they put forth a bill on immigration policy. That project had focused the work on the ground of the sightless, and that in turn revealed something important, which was the need to address issues of displacement and dispossession at the site where they were actually occurring. While my students were engaged with these issues back in Maine, I felt the need to see the national emergency that was declared at our southern border for myself. To be able to create and talk about place, one must experience it. The Paso del Norte Bridge spans the Rio Grande from El Paso to Juarez and is deemed one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Crossing into Juarez, what we found was not a threat to the nation, but a humanitarian crisis. The true threat to the nation was the creation and populating of detention centers. And those cages that were at that very time we were crossing back and forth on the bridge being built to house those refugees. While we were doing site-specific research and performance, the government was itself doing its own site work wanting to ensure its activities remained out of sight. The research and witnessing on that trip involved multiple sites of displacement. Tornillo, Texas was the location of the largest detention center for children. The days before we arrived, children were bused out of the detention center in the middle of the night to undisclosed locations as media attention turned towards separation of children from families. Through the act of witnessing, we can see what has been deliberately put out of sight and we can find a site for change. That's why I followed the forced migration of the children from Tornillo to Homestead, Florida. My students were creating responses to this work back in Maine and I was connecting them to every activist group, every artist, every organization that I came across. Homestead in 2019 became a site for me to teach social practice in terms of blending activism and performance art. As we made connections with the children in the camps and we communicated from our side of the fence, the government built ever higher fences. And we in turn, as a performance piece, bought ever taller ladders, which allowed us to keep communicating. I connected the students at that point to Santiago Zambala's writings, Only Art Can Save Us, which seemed very applicable at this time. The art that the children had created while in Ternilla was found in a dumpster by a priest in El Paso, drawings the kids had made while in detention. The art and research that I was doing, that of my students, and these asylum-seeking children were combined into an existing exhibition of work in Maine. The students installed the work, we gave talks surrounding the research, and this brought what was before only available via the news media into the local community in Maine. Equally important was the realization for me as an artist and with my role as instructor in a social practice pedagogy, 
that the art objects that I or my students create were in many ways simply artifacts of what was the real work. And even more personally, that that work needed to move into the humanitarian arena. One of the final trips before the pandemic kept us from travel was to the refugee camp in Matamoros, where 3,000 asylum seekers are still trapped due to the migrant protection protocols. I joined forces with Team Brownsville and Global Response Management, grassroots organizations which have taken on the task of supplying aid where no government has done so. This was winter, and my students organized a project that created hats for the camp, which had to be snuck in as humanitarian supplies became contraband. We put them out of sight in a false bottom to the wagons that we used to cross back and forth. We taught art to asylum-seeking children, and some of that art came back with me to my classes. I am firmly committed to personal practice and that of an educator, or as I prefer to think of it, facilitator, running simultaneously those two side by side, working on my practice right alongside my students, displaying vulnerability and struggle keeps it real and fresh for us all. Creating a textile work here of accumulated stitch and images of witnessing, which would then get immersed into the water of that very river where the asylum seekers are forced to bathe. An important aspect of site specificity that should not be overlooked is the ability to notice by being there, by seeing what's right in front of you. This sign translated as happy travels seemed to be that ironic banner that would take our gaze away from the suffering of humanity. But it is, as I see it, art's job to keep that focus by showing up and seeing what is there, and by doing so, bringing sight to the sightless. Where is the sight of the sight specific when so many of us have no place to specifically be able to land? Thank you so much, Susan. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, next, we have Nicole Condon, she, she, her pronouns, who will be presenting Integrating Charette, Community and Collaboration. Hi there, everyone. Like Ellen just said, my talk will be called Integrating Charette, Community and Collaboration. First, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Ellen and the entire team for making this event uh, happen. Uh, thank you for organizing, for reorganizing. I don't know how many times, but thank you. I'm so inspired by all of the presentations so far. So thank you. I'm, my name is Nicole condon She, and I'm an, an assistant professor in the foundation department at the Cleveland Institute of Art. I focus specifically on first year pedagogy in the foundation program. Um, I started my teaching practice in Beijing, China, lived there for nearly eight years, and about four years ago, moved to Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I go back to Beijing when possible. Currently, that's not so possible. Um, and my art practice crosses over uh, between science and the community. You can see a Chinese medicine doctor that I collaborate with there on the bottom left. Um, I'd like to talk about the Charette course. Um, and I, the first thing that always strikes me is the student expectations versus the charrette model, what the components of a charrette model offer. I think teaching first year foundation students, they come in um, with very clear expectations of what a drawing one or a design one course might offer, these concrete skills and techniques they feel very comfortable with. Um, but the charrette course, it's a very quick half semester, seven week course. Um, and the instructor role is as a facilitator. And as soon as I say the word collaboration, I can I can feel the fear. And then I continue by saying unfixed, open ended and evolving and the fear <laughs> heightens. So I asked the students on the first day what they think a charrette might be. 
I have students work in small groups on a quick icebreaker exercise. Uh, students generate word clouds thinking about what they think a charrette might be. I go over the history um, of where the charrette uh, word comes from. I talk about the little cart and French architecture students in Paris in the late 1800s. I talk about um, and frame it as an intense effort to solve a design problem within a limited time frame. And I really emphasize quick and fast how the team works uh, very quickly and receives feedback from community stakeholders. Um, but I always, inevitably, both student and faculty uh, the same, I always hear, wait, what is a charade again? Um, and I think, uh, well, I'm stealing this from a colleague. He, he said one day, just tell them it's like a croissant. Um, and so I thought the student's barrier was being comfortable in this term. They're, they're uncomfortable with the terminology and sort of this open-ended, evolving course that they're sort of less uh, comfortable with um, these less tangible skills that we're working through. And then I asked the course, um, what, what is community? And I, I'd like for us all to think about right now what, what community means to us. Um, I work with incoming freshmen that are new to college. Um, most of them are new to college. They're, they're making brand new friends. They're new to all of these classes. Uh, and they're, they're very new to this place. Um, as a class, we discuss and explore through the seven weeks what community means or could mean for that matter. Um, in terms of collaboration, individual instructors will designate specific community partners to work with, and that's up to the instructor. We've worked with uh, institutions throughout University Circle, um, such as the Botanical Gardens. You're seeing some illustrations, some students in, the, uh, in my colleague, Professor Gutierrez class worked on. I've worked with the Think Box, um, which is a maker space at Case Western University. The Science Center is nearby, as well as the Salvation Army in East Cleveland, among many others. In terms of structuring a charrette course, um, the, the, the approach will vary uh, based on the specific community partner that you're working with, uh, or the project or problem to be solved. But I think I found that by offering specific phases or a skeletal structure, it gives students that um, organization that they can rely on. So um, even on the first day, we'll work on phase one. We'll go right to the site. Uh, we'll start to learn about the background and context of a certain place, and we'll start to begin a community dialogue. I have students work on phase two and three for homework. They work on uh, continuing uh, their research, uh, building ideation sketches and initial designs. I really focus on quantity here. Um, not throwing away any sort of initial thoughts, but building as many possibilities as possible. Um, and then we come back week two, and I have students present in phase four these designs to the community. Um, oftentimes, it's uh, in focus, small focus groups with quick feedback from the community. Um, the students in phase five will rework these designs based on the community feedback. And I find that phase four and five can can, we can work with multiple rounds depending on how much time we have. Um, finally, eventually students get to phase six where they finalize and submit approval for a community uh, project. Within a short seven week course, uh, production happens. What would, uh, excuse me, <laughs> the, the project depends on what um, the charrette it is making, whether that is um, a mural or a three-dimensional project, an installation, um, moving image, but we produce uh, something and document the process. Um, in, the, in the final stage, uh, phase nine, I have students join a final critique and present the entire process uh, through the production, um, reflection, and um, gather all their materials to present a documentation log. We also invite the community um, partners to these final critiques. So I'd like to walk through a few examples in Cleveland and one in Beijing. Um, the first is a project we worked on with the Salvation Army in East Cleveland, Ohio. Um, here you're seeing pictures of small focus groups. Uh, this is the after-school um, youth group, and they are imagining 
um, various things for this new building. So you can see the sterile walls. They are um, working with CIA students to uh, think about what are some things that uh, they need and what they might imagine for the space. Uh, shortly thereafter, we enjoyed a lunch with the active adults, and they had a very different idea of what they imagined. This is the same space here. Um, so it was very interesting working with the same community, various different groups within that community, and, and hearing uh, different points of view within that and navigating that with us. The following week, um, we invited the community to visit the school. Um, I think this was a crucial uh, aspect to the project because there was an event of, um, of exchange uh, and a way to build that relationship. Students are practicing presentation skills. Uh, again, we're not focused on long sort of shaded drawings or illustrations at this point. We're really working on sort of getting as many ideas out there, students really practicing, presenting those ideas and being open to the feedback, being open to changing design and, and not, you know, kind of going with the first idea. Then comes next week, the, fo the following week, it's about a Wednesday and my class is on a Friday and I suddenly get to eat the Space Buster will be vi visiting Wade Oval, which is a, a short walk away. And the Space Buster is a temporary architectural structure with the ability to transform public spaces into impromptu community zones. And so this was something that I, I felt I had to work with my structure and be, I had to pivot a little bit and, and, and allow for this to happen. I, an opportunity that I wanted to take advantage of. So we invited the class and the community partner to join inside the Space Buster where students presented ideas for additional community feedback. So there are multiple rounds of the community feedback that was happening. Here you can see another group uh, presenting their ideas. Finally, the community selected several uh, projects for um, to be produced, and this one was one of the ones that was selected as a six-panel mural project. Um, it is about black historic icons and tells a collective narrative. It was sponsored by Dan, um, which was interesting because we had both the community at the Salvation Army, Army work on these, panels, CIA students were working on the panels, as well as uh, Target employees. So we had sort of three different groups sitting on the project. Um, eventually, the after the opening, the individual panels were exhibited in Cleveland, uh, the East Cleveland uh, Mayor's Office, the Stephanie Tubbs Jones Health, as well as the Cleveland Institute of Art. Um, the community partner um, didn't make up their mind and, and, and sort of hone in on one project, so we ended up dividing the group and work, working on multiple projects uh, in the end. And so this space that you remember, we enjoyed lunch with the active adults. Um, we worked with them and uh, made a mural in their new cafe space. Okay, so I wanted to quickly go over uh, one project that we worked on in um, Beijing. This was taught in Beijing, China at the Central Academy of Fine Art, which also um, on a charrette model, it deals with the relationship of objects, people, and places, it explores narrative. Um, without going into too much detail of the of overall project, um, the, essentially students were asked to um, acquire three meaningful objects. We took students to a local market and um, they were asked to about um, objects through the history, through the place of those objects, where they had been, um, and then gathered those and brought them back for an exhibition and documentation of those objects. You can see the various different things that they ended up gathering. And then students were asked to reimagine these objects. They were commissioned to design an art with one or more of the acquired objects, decisions based um, should have been based on related to the object, owner, and place. And then they gifted their creation to the owner of the original object or objects back in the market. So an example of these projects, um, the first group here uh, discovered a small that was selling various different spices. And in a ceramic vase, they made a layer of these various different uh, materials with some gel medium. 
and through a, a performance piece, opened this um, ceramic vase and gifted the stall owner, which he put on display for for his for his stall and and I think visitors and guests to be impressed by. Um, the next project, students found this. Uh, it's almost like a protos carrier left, and it was. Uh, broken and they students really wanted to mend it and and sort of renew it fresh it So they worked with a the fabric from a small vest that they found in a neighboring stall sort of made this one-of-a-kind Object that was both functional, but also something that could the, the stall be out of and finally one group found an uh, an apartment with a store to the market and this small little sort of dried garden on the left here, urban garden. Um, they found an, a woman sitting on this stool, this object on the right. And um, through a conversation, the woman graciously gifted the students this this object, this stool. The students learned about where it had been, why she had this. Um, and there were stories of her passing it through the hallways. Um, and the beautiful texture and pattern on the top, students responded to and decided to Design a wallpaper for for to gift to um, the woman in the urban garden here, as well as the object they gave the stool in the end as well. So finally, I'd like to end um, by saying, well, we're no longer offering a standalone charrette course at CIA. Um, we are getting this charrette model into our new foundation curriculum. We highly value what the charrette offers and how it engages place. I found that by learning about place, defining unity, and collaborating with others, students learn about themselves in relation to other voices. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was really fascinating to learn about that approach. Um, next, we have Jojen Van Winkle, he, her pronouns, who will be presenting Teaching Infiltrating Places with Site-Specific Soundscapes. Hi everyone, this is Jojen Van Winkle. I'm an assistant professor of art at Carthage College. I direct the Photography, Film, and New Media program. This evening I'll be sharing a presentation entitled Teaching Infiltrating Places with Site-Specific Sounds. Carthage College is a liberal arts school located in southeastern Wisconsin on the shores of Lake Michigan. In the spring of 2019, I was teaching sound art. The students were studying a variety of majors, including physics, English, theater, computer science, psychology, communication, and neuroscience. Most of them were taking this for a fine arts requirement. No one was an art major. Please post the first polling question if possible. In this course, we created a site-specific sound piece that was to infiltrate a space. Our process was multi-layered, involving research, location scouting, sound mapping, more research, recording, and editing. Please post the second polling question if possible. The project's concept was to explore this relationship between the space and the audio experience possibly leading us to metaphoric relationships between place and what we were listening to or are listening to, hopefully revealing audio stories that may be juxtaposed or highlighting a space. My own research is a form of digital storytelling, and if you're not familiar with it, digital storytelling can be many things. Often digital storytelling is seen as a visual experience, but it can also be an auditory experience. It has implications in scholarly areas as well. But the question really for our, us and our students is why would we even do digital storytelling? And if we think about that, stories are truly the fire that's within us. It's a ways in which we can access our emotions, express experiences. They can be things that are comedies or tragedies, it can be full of wonder, mystery, also grief, things that make up our daily lives. Stories connect us with communities. I think one of the most important characteristics is that they can help us develop empathy and make us think. Listening to stories gives us a glimpse of life in a new way from new perspectives, even if those stories are abstract. To frame this project, we watch the work of Susan Phillips. Phillips's work explores the psychological and sculptural dimensions of sound. 
She records her voice and also her work as musical connections. In this photo here, we see where she infiltrated a supermarket. We also studied Janet Cardiff's work. And additionally, we went to Chicago to visit two particular places. One was the Chicago Lincoln Park Conservatory. In this fern room, you can experience the fluorosonic events that are sponsored by the Experimental Sound Studio. We listened to Anne Guthrie's Hackle too. For Guthrie's piece, she had recordings from the actual space itself. Speakers were spread throughout the space. This was new for the students. Most of them had not experienced a site-specific sound installation in person. We toured the Experimental Sound Studio. It's several floors. These images are in the basement where larger editing suites are. We also connected with Rob Fry, who's a visiting artist at that time. Rob Fry rides his bike, then he disassembles it and plays it. He can connect it to solar power or direct electrical power. We had the opportunity then to create some soundscapes with him. This particular project's prompt allowed the students to seek out spaces around campus. Ideally, I wanted to, us to work with speakers that were on the location, but often we had to use a QR code and listen to things with headphones just because I wasn't always able to get access to the speakers during our class time. These are some of our learning objectives. Our project was happening about mid-semester. Location scouting was really important. Students could choose any space on campus that, that they could get access to and that we could also visit then as a class during our class time. One of the students here chose the chapel. You'll be hearing her piece shortly. We had a critique schedule set over two days. Theater Spirits was a site-specific piece designed for the Wartburg Theater. It was created by an international student from Japan who was studying at Carthage for a year. She made a ticket for each person on the ticket was a QR code. Here's an excerpt from Theater Spirits. In the main chapel, we had the opportunity to listen to a very powerful soundscape. The soundscape was about sexual assault and sexual harassment. After we listened to the soundscape, we had a discussion about rape culture. A student who created this work volunteered for a sexual assault hotline. I'll be playing the clip now. I do want to give a warning. The content contains audio that some listeners may find disturbing. You may want to turn off your headphones until I go to the next slide. What? Slide. Poor. And every friend that I know has a story like mine. And the world tells me we should take it as a compliment. 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 The man that I trust gets his hands in my pants, but I don't want none of that. Slut. Slut. Poor. To add more credits, please press 1. Athletics are popular on our campus. One of the students was a swimmer, and he wanted to do a piece in the pool. His piece was called Fire. This is an excerpt. The tower is a dormitory on campus with the longest elevator ride. The student created a soundscape to juxtapose the experience of the elevator. The soundscape had pedestrian traffic that experienced it. Uh, people were coming in and out of the elevator as it was being played on a Bluetooth speaker. It is unnerving and also humorous in nature. I do want to give a warning that the audio for this some listeners may also find disturbing. You may turn off your audio until I advance to the next slide. <laughs> The 
This soundscape was created by a student who was studying psychology. He was concerned about the amount of anxiety he hears other students express on campus. He decided to create a soundscape that involved words of encouragement, something that you would not expect to be playing in that space. Here's an excerpt. Sure, now. sometimes things may get a bit out of your control and you start losing hope. But just remember, you've made it this far, haven't you? Every other time things have gotten tough, you've been able to make it through. Sure, sometimes things don't work out the way you intended them to, but the fact that you're here to listen to this today is proof that you can keep going. There are two small chapels located around campus. One student created a soundscape for the meditation chapel. The inspiration was not the sounds inside the space, but rather outside the space. They focused on the types of sounds you hear coming through the windows, so the muffled sounds. It created a dreamlike space. Music is big at our school. This is one of our recital halls. The student who chose this space decided to bring the outside in to create a juxtaposed experience of being outside while inside. We were instructed to sit in this very specific manner, facing the stage. The theater was a popular space. This was a very humorous site-specific piece about directing gone awry. Every space has potential. One student decided to interview his peers about their most spiritual experience on campus. Much to his surprise, he found that their spiritual experiences did not occur in a quote-unquote designated religious or spiritual place on campus. He decided to create a piece about juxtaposition and to infiltrate the space on campus, which he considered to be the least spiritual. Here's an excerpt of the soundscape. And I actually felt like I was sinking into the floor, but not like in a bad kind of sinking way. And, and I just felt that like symmetry and connected with the universe. I'm very and much happy to say like something about that just for a moment. So much felt it was like absolutely was a, a pattern of everything, of rhythm, and it was amazing. My hope is that you will work with your students to design digital stories and that you'll consider how these stories help to build community. A heartfelt thanks to Ellen and everyone involved in making this conference possible for us. Thank you for your time. Listen more, stay safe, and make some art. Thank you so much, Jojen. And we raced right past your two poles, so I don't want to miss those. If we could, Seth, put the first poll up for Jojen. So do you engage in digital storytelling projects with your students? This would be for folks who are teaching. Looks like about 60% have voted, 70. Nearly there, 85%. Anyone else wanna vote in there? All right, let's call it. Go ahead, Seth. What do we have re for results? Okay, it looks like yes, 40% of people do engage with storytelling projects. 42% don't, and we've got about 18% for whom it does not apply. And let's do that second poll, which is, have you tried to explain sound art to non-art majors? This might only uh, apply for a, a few folks out there, but Go for it. 44% have voted, 70% have voted, 90%, anyone else wanna vote? All right, let's call that one, Seth. And it looks like, yes, this is impressive. 42% of our webinar goers this evening have tried explaining sound art to non-majors. I find that so heartening. I love that sound art is being taught out there. Um, and then 38% no, 20% does not apply. Um, so thank you for thinking up those poll questions, Jojen. This is really great. So next, we have Natasha Pestish, she, her pronouns, who will be presenting ethical and philosophical questions related to teaching place. And that'll begin shortly. Thank you, Natasha. That was great. Um, next, we have Billy London Gray, she, her pronouns, who will be presenting sound walks and psychogeographic map making. But first, I think we're going to start with a poll. Yes. 
And we're at about 82% voted. I, I think that's close. It looks like anyone else want to vote real quick? All right, let's 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 call that. Okay. So am I on? Yep, we see you and we hear you, Billy. Thanks. Hey, hey everybody. I'm very excited to be part of this. And I have a pre-recorded video because I have some different kinds of media um, in my presentation. So um, Seth, you could go ahead and get that started. Hi, my name is Billy Linden Gray, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Texas at Arlington. I'm going to talk about assignments that I do with my undergraduate foundations of art students using sound walks and psychogeographic map making. Just for a little context, the University of Texas at Arlington is a very diverse campus and one of the things that I find really valuable about teaching place at the foundations level is um, that it brings to light that not everyone's experiences of place, places on campus specifically, are the same and it helps make a space for a plurality of voices and viewpoints through these assignments. So the first thing I do is this little mini project um, that I call Sense of Place. So the prompt is, and groups of one to three students make a short sound piece that captures a sense of place on campus. It should be accompanied by an image. I tell them once they're in the groups, go observe your place for a few minutes, form a consensus about what defines its placiness, and consider you know, different options for conveying that placiness. Are you gonna take a documentary approach? Is it gonna be representational? Are you gonna make it fictionalized? Are you gonna use abstraction to help give more of a sense that's poetic? Then after they've done that, they are gonna present their sound piece and their image to the class in three minutes. I have them submit things to Canvas discussion board, um, also so, have reference to their work later but it makes it easy to turn it in. Total time this takes is about an hour so they have about 30 minutes for making it and about 30 minutes for sharing it. So here's one example of this little mini project. Again just 30 minutes working on the project. Today we are sitting in a grove at UTA. The sun is shining, the trash cans are bright, and the people are pretty. I do see on my right side a person walking with a nice water bottle. Hydration is key. Oh, she's on her phone. She's distracted. Distracted walking is never good. Never good. Never good. So that goes on for about two minutes, but the students really got to the space and responded to it by thinking like, oh, we could be the crocodile hunter <laughs> and we can, you know, narrate what our classmates or the other people in this space are doing. And their map is obviously simple, but I wanted them to, you know, think about the arrangement of the space that they were in. So I followed this up with a project called Psychogeography Maps. And um, the prompt is that they need to make a map that iconically represents a specific place and symbolically represents their personal experience there. It should incorporate inventive or interactive elements rather than just being a static image. They have to make a special trip to the place. They have to turn in field sketches, notes, and prep materials. And they can loosely interpret what a map is. It doesn't need to be kind of the bird's eye graphic overview. This introduces the idea of psychogeography, um, not in all of its depth, but as the way that places affect our behavior. It gets them to pay attention to how places affect them, how they define places. And it furthers our in-class discussion about ways to convey emotion, mood, and imagination within or even laid over reality. It also builds community through sharing stories, which is something that is an important aspect of foundations, of, of giving students that cohort feeling, um, and certainly going back to that idea of people experience places differently, the sharing of stories helps you know, further that diversity of voices in the classroom. So this is one example of a student's map. Um, this student 
couldn't decide what to do, so she asked her friends to come up with a scavenger hunt for her. Friends not in the class, just, you know, people that lived in her dorm. And they come up with this task for her. She went out and took pictures at all of those places and matched it up. And then she drew these small drawings and decided as another interactive element, in addition to leaping through the photographs, to make this red film that could run over the images. And the red film will make those little blue drawings, it, it reduces the red of the buildings and makes the little blue drawings stand out. Students were so attracted to this with this tiny scale and being able to get up close to it. And, you know, the obvious work that went into doing all of this by hand. Another example, let me get this one playing too. So this student got a little speaker like you would put in a greeting card that's attached to a small storage unit that automatically plays when you press the button so that it can record a minute of sound as an mp3. And uh, they made a recording of a sound walk compiled by going through this space. Other students were you know, pretty excited to just come up and, you know, press the belly of that Buddha and have it start playing the, the soundtrack for them. The last project I want to talk about is a sound walk project. This isn't from my 2D class. I do this with my, uh, with new media and intermedia classes. So students who are trying to acquire skills using different kinds of digital technology. So the prompt is to make a four to five minute sound walk that captures an experience in a specific place on or near campus. I encourage them to use their phones, although some of them have access to more specific kinds of recording equipment and um, stereo recorders and shotgun microphones and tools that can you know, do more than a phone can do. I encourage them, but don't require that they make field sketches and notes. And I encourage them to follow their attractions as they go through the space and make this walk to really drift and engage with the idea of the derive. It revisits the idea of psychogeography if they took my 2D class and it again pushes them to think of ways that they can convey emotion, mood, and imagination with non-visual elements since you know sound is the primary conveyor of information in a sound walk. It also introduces the idea of site specificity for streamable media, and I find that a lot of students are pretty used to thinking of streamable media as something that you can experience anywhere. It doesn't have a specific relation to place, or it actually insulates you from the place around you. With making a sound walk for a specific location near campus, I want them to think of their peers going in, you know, listening to their sound walk in this specific space and how does that affect it. Here's an example of a sound walk that was accompanied with stop motion video. This is an excerpt from a piece that's about five and a half minutes long. So the rest of this video is about another, you know, four minutes showing those dryers just going and going and their times counting down. It switches to black and white and it really conveys the sense of sitting in this room, doing a chore, waiting for the chore to be over. It seems mundane and simple, but I, I like it as an example because it's something that is real familiar in a student's life. <clears throat> that they're thinking about. They're thinking about this as a as a place that they inhabit. Some helpful resources that I pass along to students. First, our campus library, maybe yours as well, will check out cameras, tablets, um, different sorts of recording devices, and even charging cords for phones to students for a couple hours at a time. And doing this on campus, 
that can be very helpful, especially if you're asking students to use technology and they may be at the end of their power, they can just go to the library, check these things out and get on with the project. The Walking Artist Network in the UK is an active group that I've subscribed to their listserv and have found that to, you know, provide me a lot of useful resources. Um, voice memos, camera apps on a phone or tablet are great. Using Audacity, it's a free sound editing app if you're trying to save students on costs. Um, it is not as robust as Adobe Audition, but it's a very effective editing platform. Um, Autodesk Sketchbook is a free app that allows students to make drawings so that if they're, they can draw on photographs, they can make new drawings, and it's a great way for people who want to take notes on a map. Lapsid is a free time lapse app for students who don't have that already on their phone. Quick is a free video editing app made by GoPro. It's pretty intuitive, allows you to edit video and sound pretty easily. Google Maps is good if students want to use it to track their movements. I don't find that it is as robust as these last two apps, which are much more specific. So I'm going to talk about them a little bit. View Ranger, it's free. It lets you make really precise pedestrian maps of a route. It'll give you some analytics on the route as well. And it even lets you associate pictures with different waypoints as you go. What Three Words is another fun app. It's more poetic and introduces an element of chance into the projects because it, rather than using something like global positioning coordinates, it assigns three words to triangulate a location. I do not know how their word system works, but it's pretty fun because it comes up with combinations like scars escapes rear, selling backdrop banter. Some of these I've found really, you know, read like kind of playful inspirations or sometimes they're a little uncanny for the location that you're at. It'll also let you save maps that have these three letter words over the map or over an image at the location where you're at. Um, having these three words might be a good jumping off point for them. I'm also providing the documents that I provide to my students as their, you know, prompts and instructions. So those have um, different questions for discussion, as well as, you know, resources and artists to reference. Thanks. Thank you, Billy. That was fantastic. All right. And that, uh, Billy's was the last presentation. So I would invite now all of our presenters to um, share their videos, their video feed. Um, so if you want to turn on your video, folks. There we go. Awesome. And Natasha isn't able to share the video today. Her her video is not working. Um, I'm not sure who we're missing now. There we go. Excellent. Wonderful. All right. So we've gotten some really great questions in the question box during the presentations. And I would invite others to continue submitting if you'd like to submit, a, especially on our most recent um, panelists. That would be fantastic. I'll keep an eye on that. Um, but to start with, I've got five or six questions here. Um, I'm going to start at the top. So this first one, Jen, is for you. Um, and they're asking, can Jen go into more depth about yeah. the new pedagogical framework about art in the cities that she talked about? Um, the new pedagogical framework, meaning the exploded class, I think the exploded city. I'm assuming that that's what the question is about. I think so. <laughs> okay. Um, I can't really go into more depth except just to re just just to mention that that's what I was exposed to at the at the convening. Um, but what I could say is that what I ended up using was kind of uh, was was using was uh, sorry. I need to stop for a second. Um, I can't really go into more depth except to, just to refer to that book. Um, but what I could do is talk about the fact that like what I ended up doing was kind of using kind of four different contexts for thinking about place. So by letting the city determine, um, become the frame of reference, I ended up having a conversation that kind of looked at four different contexts for learning. So um, the cities and the histories of deindustrialized space between cities, um, the concept of the public, um, Let's see, I'm trying to think of another one. Social, alienated social relationships was, if there was a third one. 
and um, and there was one more. So I kind of use those things. So the goal is like to actually um, all of what you do is actually kind of embedded in place. And the way it iterated in open engagement was that there was about 100 active sites during the convening. So the the whole city in, sen in sense was activated. Um, and so that's one thing to think about. It's like essentially that was part of like kind of a 70s philosophy around like opening up the classroom and basically arguing that you will learn in place and you will learn from place, um, kind of responding to kind of earlier kind of 19th century kind of forms of education. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's what they were getting at with that question. Um, next, I have a question for Susan. And this is, pragmatically speaking, are you applying for funding to support your students travel for these to these various places? Can you speak to that? Susan, can you turn on your mic? I'm not hearing you. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, great, because my camera's a little bit weird. Um, so a lot of the travel that I did was with myself and my partner, at times with students, but when when you're going into a place like Juarez, which um, is really one of the, the most dangerous places in the world. It's right up there with Syria and Aleppo. So um, Juarez and Matamoros, the insurance and the, the dangers really precluded us taking students. And so that really becomes kind of the way, one of the most important things about SITE for me was to show them the value of that, as well as having, you know, at times them come with me. But most of the time I'm traveling by myself or with my partner and they're doing the work back and we're doing live feeds and things like that so that I can bring them to the site. So, um, and we live in Maine, so it's a, it's a not very diverse place. And so I really um, wanted to bring the border to them. And so that's really the way it was. Um, they are doing a lot of work specifically about place, but we have students that um, at this point are from Mexico, from Turkey, Brazil, and other places. So um, the way the class is structured now, when they travel back to their home countries, we connect with projects. And so I'm trying to really talk about how we can do social practice um, in some ways virtually with different locations. So we also did a large um, MOOC with Duke University where we were um, doing place based in um, maybe the same project, one in Tehran and one was in Maine. And so how do those, how do those work? A subway in Boston, a subway um, in, you know, Europe. And so that's kind of the way we were doing it. Um, so to, to really be brief about the, the refugee camps and things like that, a lot of that was me traveling, bringing back research or sending them information as I'm there. Thanks for that. I'm sure that helps answer the, the questions lingering there. Yes. Yes. Um, wonderful. All right. Next, um, I, I feel bad. I didn't write down who this question was directed towards, but folks who had mind maps, um, someone asked, I'm loving the mind maps. What did you use to create them? Any, anyone who had mind maps? Was that Nicole, maybe? Yes, it was Nicole. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not hearing you yet. Oh, not sure. It, okay. Well, the comment is out there. They loved your mind maps. <laughs> okay. Oh, here we go. The organizer go. had muted me. <laughs> um, um, I can get the exam of, of that, but it's an app that I use, and it's really convenient because students, um, I, I have together in, in a small group, they can do it on their phone. And then it, I can project it on uh, sort of all from a projector. It, it's really convenient and easy to use. I can put it in the document for everyone. Thank you, Nicole. All right. Um, <laughs> I've got a question. This one is posed for anyone. I taught an intro to art class for non-majors and discussed community-engaged projects. Almost all were very supportive 
thought there should be more funding for these types of projects. How do we get college campuses and their communities to tap into this support? Anybody have reflections on, I think at the core there, we're asking about funding and supporting these types of projects. So if anyone wants to share inspiration on that. Yeah, Billy. So I did a class called Art Essentials, which is kind of like orientation for art majors, but it's paired with a class called, that's like a FYE class, first year experience class, where the art majors and non-art majors are all kind of mixed together. And in the FYE part of this class, um, there is a service learning component that goes up into the community, and a lot of that is facilitated by a unit at our university called the Office of Service Learning. And they have professional staff that, um, so like rather than a class getting a grant to do a one-off project, the Office of Service Learning builds these relationships that they maintain and are ongoing, and it makes it great when you're teaching a class because you're not kind of like starting from square one making that relationship. The university has already facilitated a lot of that um, as kind of like an ombudsman to make that happen. Um, and I work at a large university. I don't know how common it is to have that at other places, but it's a, it's a really great resource and um, might be something worth bringing up to like the faculty senate to see if that could be developed. Thanks for that. I've encountered that model at other universities as well, but you're right, I think it's a scale issue. Like it was a pretty large university that had yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else yeah, want I, to chime in with thoughts on funding? Um, I, I can. Oh. Oh. There we go, Jojen. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jojen. You haven't seen my, my face in person yet. It's nice. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, right now, I have an equity in the classroom grant. It's part of a, a, a sub-grant from the Lum, Lumina Foundation. And um, granting, I think one of the really great or resources to grant is to always have your eyes and, and ears open for every moment. This grant, I applied to it because I went to a, a workshop that was funded, that is, um, was a workshop focused on equity, inclusion, and diversity in higher ed. And it was through the West, Con I live in Wisconsin, it was through the Wisconsin um, Colleges, Universities, a large association. And it was just something that was kind of thrown up on the screen near the end of the conference. And when I say um, scrounging, um, that's kind of what I mean. And I know this isn't necessarily the answer that you might be looking for, like where's the big database, but I think having your ear to the ground and your feelers out there. Um, the grant itself is, is nominal. I'll be working with my color photography class, um, working on, with uh, communities, although we'll find in the fall how, how we will be doing that. Um, but it, it, it was something that, um, it wasn't necessarily something you find on Facebook or that you'd find in other kind of networking um, s sources uh, that you would look for. It was basically um, listening and having um, kind of being in the right place at the right time in terms of that. Um, the other, so maybe what I'm trying to say is that you, you might be able to find funding to do projects that you want that aren't necessarily linked directly to your field or to like arts funding, but you can incorporate it into the classroom in some unique way. Thanks for that, Jojen. Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, I'm going to check the chat real quick. Here we have a question. We're living in the age of COVID now. Wondering if any of the presenters have used these approaches to engage with students through remote learning. And I think, Jojen, you just touched on that near the tail end of your comment. Like, what will this, this type of learning look like um, as we move forward? I don't know if anybody has thoughts or plans for this fall. Oh, and I'm seeing, Susan, it looks like you're talking, but we're not hearing. Still not hearing. I don't know, Jen. Are you raising your hand a little bit, or no? no. Okay. Can you hear me now? Are you? Are we you can hear me? you, Susan. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. So I'm teaching a class right now um, online, and it was initially going to involve. Um, I have a landscape background as well, so community gardens, guerrilla gardens, and mm -hmm. so I've changed it to respond to uh, the pandemic in terms of guerrilla practices. And so the students are learning 
this is graduate MFA, but the students are learning uh, processes that they might not um, really place-based processes like EcoPrint, natural dye from a specific location, um, creating plant pigments um, from uh, earth and lake pigments and things like that. So there's processes and I'm doing the demos for that, some of it on site by myself, you know, with a phone or video or else in, in my home. And then they're going to specific sites or using their geographic location. Um, and so we're talking about place um, as well as then creating something from those processes uh, that's more of a, a guerrilla intervention in sight. So we've done some um, different things uh, with seed bombing and uh, um, different uh, drawings that we placed outside of the Portland uh, Museum of Art, which in Maine is the biggest city. And so we um, are, they're doing intervention work, but they're relating it and responding to their particular uh, response and situation about sheltering in place. And so it's had some really interesting um, interesting outcomes because they're all over the state right now and some of them are actually um, in quarantine in another state. And so that's been really interesting. So, so there's the component of a guerrilla practice that's in an intervention as well as demos on sustainable kind of plant-based um, site-based processes too. So um, it's been it's been really working out really well. But I will say it's a tremendous, as probably all of you are experiencing with this, it's a tremendous amount of work because yeah. you're doing um, so. You know the the demos and things that we would have done in our studio, but it's worked out well so far. Thanks for that, Susan. That's really great. It might lend some ideas for folks. Jojen, what were you going to say? Yeah, um, this summer I'm working with a student who um, has a, a SURE grant, which is a, a, an undergraduate grant for our, our college. Many colleges have that. And he's um, he's focused on graphic design and art, and he's also a choreographer, dancer. And so what um, I've, why I'm bringing this up is that I guess um, I've been thinking a lot about how, what are the benefits right now of going virtual and what can I offer my students through these benefits? And so something I've been doing is I've set up a series of three mentors for him. He, um, uh, um, I had recently done an e-residency that was like kind of at the tail end of my um, teaching this spring. And I worked with a, a dancer in Israel as well as a artist in the UK. And that's kind of a long story, but what it allowed me was to bring the cosmopolitan sense of artists around the world into my little home or my little space um, where I'm at. And so I decided to extend that practice to my student that I'm, I'm working with or mentoring. And so what I've done is I've set up a series of conversations that he can have. Um, two of them, one is with this dancer, um, Tal um, Gar Garmiza, who's located just outside of um, Tel Aviv. And then I've also set up a, t a time for him to work with a professional choreographer who's based in the UK. And I got to meet him. He's originally from India. I got to meet him through this program that I was doing to um, Bilbao Singh. And um, then uh, finally, I'm connecting him with a graphic designer who's located in Chicago that I know. And so what, what I'm trying to say is I think that one asset you can bring is that you can cheaply <laughs> and easily, um, as long as you can get a good connection, um, connect your students to people around the world that probably wouldn't have time. I mean, the people that I'm connecting with are usually really busy and not sitting around in front of a you know screen. And so um, that's what's really exciting is that um, they're like, hey, yeah, I got an hour, I can talk to them. And that, that makes for an enriching conversation. And also, I mean, my hope is that we will be able to travel at some level, what that will look like in the future for the environment, who knows. And, um, but this idea that there are other artists out there thinking and creating and making in this time. And that's what I wanna be able to instill. And I'm hoping to continue that this um, fall in some way in my classes. I don't know if I'll be able to do um, as many people, um, but I'm gonna be trying to do that as much as I can. And so I think that's a nice component and it kind of also takes some relief off of our gallery. Like we have a small gallery and trying to bring in visiting artists. And so it, it affords us a way to um, broaden the horizons of our students to think about 
um, or listen to people and that are, you know, just like them in a lockdown somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. All right, we've got a, a couple more questions here. Um, some are for specific people. And if you want to keep entering questions, feel free. I'll keep peeking at that question box for our as attendees. Um, going back to the top, Jen, um, could you talk a little bit more about how you discussed art washing with your students? I can a little bit. Um... I'm trying to think. We were following some of the conversations at that time um, about art washing that was happening in California. Um, and so um, and so I think what one of the things that I, I think we have to think about that I wanted some of our students to sort of think about was specifically in relationship to the kind the kind of responsibility that artists that that artists that artists themselves can be leveraged in a certain kind of way. Um, that there are ways in which um, that people in power can use art or um, as that kind of like that kind of tertiary step in gentrification um, where artists start to kind of maybe go with kind of good intentions and you know um, occupy storefronts, occupy deindustrialized spaces and um, that that value that they are adding to that place through the work that they are doing, right? Um, and taking those kind of deinvested spaces and kind of activating them in a certain kind of way, unless they're attentive to like the larger community conversations that are happening around them, um, can be leveraged a certain kind of way for development, right? And that's an unintended consequence of one of the things that they're seeking to do is to do this deinvestment, but um, to kind of, and because, so what they need to do is sort of find themselves in, um, and commonality with those around them. So, for example, what do we all need? For example, like what's our shared, um, what's the shared need that, for example, that kind of platform, like that, you know, whatever you're doing to reinvest the space can provide. And so that's the kind of the basic conversations. Um, but we we're part of like kind of like much longer sort of threaded conversations that are happening on a national level, specifically around that question. So thanks. Thank you for that. That was mm -hmm. great. Um, I have a. This one was just for Susan. Just a comment. Um, impressive and potent quote from Dr. Susan Smith. Where is the site of site specific when so many have no place to land? Um, so I think that struck people and was resonant. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and then moving on to Nicole, a question. Wow, the space buster. Could you review how you got access to this? And you, oh, your sound is still not working. I thought it was just momentary. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. And, and and again, as I was thinking about um, these, I kept, you know, thinking about lessons learned. And one of those was taking advantage of a, a thing that was not part of your original plan and being flexible and, um, you know, kind of taking it was not on the plan in the, in the beginning. And I, I received an email from um, Billy. You talked about a service department. Um, we had uh, previously an engaged uh, practice department, so a type thing at, at a small art school, um, and they had contacted the engaged practice department in which they sent that to faculty that might be interested. And this was a few days before my class was about to start, so it was very much um, taking advantage, jumping right into this because, you know, I, I didn't want to miss the opportunity. So that's, that's how I, I mean, it just fell out. <laughs> yeah, sometimes those things fall yeah. in our lap as educators and you make a decision, so that's great. Um, all right, next I have a question for Jojen. For the theater spirits, what was the purpose of the QR code assigned to the audience or participants? I think this was for that ticket type thing you showed us. I wonder if Jojen, I wonder if, are you frozen Jojen? Maybe that's, we'll, we'll circle back to that. Um, and I'm just checking here in the questions. I've got another one um, for Jen. It asking, how deep do students engage in the, in the field experiences during your class? Are they developed over the entire semester or one field trip? Do they have contacts within the community that they engage with? So just a little bit more detail on, on the field experience. Absolutely. 
Um, and this is something that I'm trying to put into question. I think one of the things that I started out with with this idea of the field experiences with it was that you know we went from you know as many as eight. I think I counted one year it was twelve <laughs> sites, okay. including like jumping from site to site in one thing. So when you say how deeply. Um, that's the question that I'm actually really trying to grapple with is the deepness of it. Um, but at some point it felt so itinerant. And although we were, what was helping was that we were able to sort of see patterns, right? Like looking at different kinds of artist run spaces and then sort of seeing patterns and making kind of synthetic conversations. But we weren't really investing deeply specifically in coming to know things really, really well beyond the depth of that conversation that we may have had on that site in that place. Um, the deeper conversations happened when I, for example, would put three to four people, um, we would create a very specific kind of activity that might involve three or four different people, um, where it might be like a site, it might be a specific project, it might be something connected to the project. Um, I might do something, right, like, you know, a, a conceptual kind of um, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I found it ridiculous how often I tried to replicate classrooms, you know, like I'd be like, okay, here's where I'll show my PowerPoint, right? Like, you know, people were laughing right, hyster hysterically where I was kind of replicating classrooms so much. Um, I hope you understand that like when I'm being like this, I'm actually, I'm right, right at this moment, I'm really thoughtfully kind of rethinking like all the different ways in which I had to let go on of so much of that, like how is the knowledge happening um, and what kind of knowledge we're talking about. So. To answer that question about the deepness, no, not really, to be perfectly honest, right? And I meant not deeply, meaning that the students would invest deeply, meaning they may, they would, they would do the field guide, and then sometimes they would pick one of those projects and then invest more deeply. So the, I would say, they, so they would do go into some kind of depth, but the depth was also contextualizing it, historicizing it, contextualizing it, thematizing it. Um, it was research-based necessarily, not necessarily always going back and investigating like the site or in conversation. It was often art historically, um, for example, or using urban studies, political science, you know, those kinds of structures and understanding. So again, I was bringing a lot of disciplinary knowledge. You know, my disclosure, I'm from liberal arts, right? So I, I come from that place um, and that's how I read. And um, I think those are powerful tools, but I'm also interested in one of some of the things that I can't teach <laughs> and how much I kind of have to undo sometimes when I'm in place. So there you go. Thank you, Jen. That's great. Um, so I'm watching our time. We have one minute left and I want to be really respectful of people's evenings. Two hours is a long time to dedicate to video time on our screen. So um, first and foremost, thank you to our wonderful presenters. It's a, a beautiful investment of time and energy to share with our community. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you to all the attendees. Uh, just one last reminder that this is a four evening event. We started yesterday. Uh, today was day two. We have day three and four tomorrow and Friday. Um, I welcome you to share this with your friends. Um, this is free. Just sign up and, and you can join us for the remaining two evenings. So have a beautiful evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.